Every week on CyberWork, listeners ask us the same question. What cybersecurity skills should I learn? Well, try this. Go to infosecinstitute.com slash free to get your free cybersecurity talent development ebook. It's got in-depth training plans for the 12 most common roles, including SOC analyst, penetration tester, cloud security engineer, information risk analyst, privacy manager, secure coder, and more. We took notes from employees and a team of subject matter experts to build training plans that align with the most in-demand skills. You can use the plans as is or customize them to create a unique training plan that aligns with your own unique career goals. One more time, just go to infosecinstitute.com slash free or click the link in the description to get your free training plans, plus many more free resources for cyber work listeners. Do it. Infosecinstitute.com slash free. Now, on with the show. Today on CyberWork, I'm talking about development security with Jacob DePriest, the VP, Deputy Chief Security Officer at GitHub. In 2021, GitHub significantly ramped up its security department. Jacob told me all about the commitment to security that's uh, come about and how you can move your own organization toward a developer-focused security team. Whether you're just hearing about GitHub now or you, you're using GitHub from the moment your workday starts, you will absolutely want to check out this episode of CyberWork. Welcome to this week's episode of the CyberWork with InfoSec podcast. Each week we talk with a different industry thought leader about cybersecurity trends, the way those trends affect the work of InfoSec professionals while offering tips for breaking in or moving up the ladder in the cybersecurity industry. Uh, today's guest, Jacob DePriest, is the Vice President, Deputy Chief Security Officer at GitHub. DePriest has over 16 years of experience in the field of cybersecurity, engineering, and open source across both the public and private sectors. Previously, DePriest held a senior executive role in the National Security Agency, or NSA, of the United States and founded his own tech consultancy firm in Washington, D.C. So today we're going to be talking all things GitHub. Um, we're going to, we'll, we'll bring it up soon, but in 2021, GitHub made some uh, important um, strategic changes that uh, Jacob is part of, and I'm looking forward to hearing more about them. So Jacob, thanks for joining me. Welcome to CyberWork. Thanks, Chris. Really happy to be here. I look forward to our conversation. Great. Uh, me too. So, um, yeah, I, you know, just uh, by way of breaking the ice, let's start a little bit about your origin story. How did you first get interested in computers and tech? It was there. What was the initial draw to all of this stuff? Yeah, I think uh, like a lot of folks drawn to tech as a kid, I uh, played with Lego, probably took apart and attempted to put back together way too many of my parents' electronics Okay, <laughs> uh, in the house. Um, not always successfully, unfortunately. Were, were they cool with that? Did they uh, uh, did you get a lot of For the most to part, it? yeah, they okay. were cool with it. <laughs> um, and I first kind of got fascinated with... Um, you know, PCs uh, in kind of middle school, high school, and then took a programming class and math class in high school and had a really great set of teachers that kind of pushed me along the mm -hmm. technical path. I knew I liked the classes, had no idea what that meant. And so they were like, you should really think about engineering if you like all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And then the same teacher, my math teacher in high school, got me a um, summer internship at a local engineering company who built, uh, they built AM radio towers and components. Wow. So I like did uh, software design and build for them during the summers uh, for my first couple of years after high school and just kind of pulled me into like practical engineering work and then okay. also started building a love for software defined radio around then as well. Now, uh, do you have a sense of whether this particular, your particular high school experience was, was noteworthy in the sense of were there a lot of schools in the area that were offering this sort of extensive level of computer experience? Or do you feel like you really, uh, that this was like a, a, a an outlier that you were very lucky to be part of? I think I was lucky in the sense that I had great teachers, right? I think okay. like the classes in and of themselves weren't remarkable. Um, gotcha. I think it was someone taking an interest and in seeing like, hey, this, this person really is interested in this and is really lights up when we talk about Got these it. topics uh, and didn't just brush it aside and kind of spent the extra time with me. And uh, I, you know, I actually sent the, that teacher a note uh, a few months ago. Uh, we reconnected on one of the social media platforms and just, you know, kind of told the story because I don't think they ever knew that. And it had a huge impact that kind of shaped the course of my professional life. Oh, I love to hear that. Yeah. And, oh, I, I you know, I've done that for a few teachers and they're always 
just thrilled because yeah, it can be very exhausting otherwise if you don't if you don't know whether what what happens with any any of this stuff at the end of it. So indeed, um, yeah. So um, going further down, I like to look at you know my guest LinkedIn profiles because it gives me a sense of the type of work that you've taken on over the years and the types of roles you climbed through to you know get through where you are now. So. Um, I want to ask you in whatever way you feel comfortable about, about your journey up the ladder in the NSA. So from 2006 to 2021, 15 years, you moved through NSA roles, starting with a hardware software engineer and technical lead position up through engineering manager, technical director, director developer productivity, OSS evangelist, and finally senior director IT integration. So none of these promotions seem terribly unexpected in terms of taking a wide lateral step, but it does seem like these changes of focus gave you a huge jump in how to handle your the overall view of IT in a way that makes sense to your current role at GitHub. So can you talk about your your time at the NSA in this regard and how it built your skills toolbox? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, kind of going in to, to cover the last thing first, I think mm -hmm. the diversity in those jobs and roles did give me a special appreciation for being able to do something as complex as security leadership at GitHub because we're an incredibly technical company. And so, mm -hmm. you know, being in the security team also uh, requires a fair bit of technical uh, know-how in terms of engineering and sort of the whole span of the system. And so, you know, my journey at NSA, I, I started out in software-defined radio. I, I came came out of grad school with um, software-defined uh, radio engineering experience and did my master's work in that. And so I spent a lot of time focused on like real-time processing and how to blend uh, really complex math processing with reusable software components, which was super fun. And that's when I kind of started getting into developer tools and open source. Um, one of the projects in there, we ended up going through the process to open source, uh, which took a really long time in the government, particularly at NSA, because it was yeah. fairly early on. And I mean, we were at the first project to be open source from NSA, but one of the larger ones at the time. Okay, And so, you know, the combination of like building things for developers and open source has been something that I've I've done for a really long time and really enjoy. Mm -hmm. Um, and kind of moved into people management around that time as well. So did that for a few years and then, uh, kind of had the opportunity to pivot into more cloud processing, distributed processing with other technologies. Uh, and that's the fun thing about a place like NSA and, and a lot of federal agencies are similar where you can sort of reinvent and, and take what you've learned and build it into something new and shift and still mm -hmm. kind of have multiple, uh, mini careers inside a, a single, uh, agency. Uh, so I kind of came off of that and then went and founded uh, this developer productivity team. And so we were responsible for kind of all the developer tools at the agency. It was the, kind of the first time it had been centralized like that. Right. So everything from developer security to kind of the normal uh, CICD pipelines and things like that. Um, and so that was a, just a fun opportunity to kind of build that team out, get the funding, get the buy-in, do yep. all the work associated with that. And then that kind of led to the IT integration work and enterprise security work of, okay, now taking those experiences and how do we help scale that for the rest of the agency in other kind of core productivity areas. Um, and so it kind of all built together. Interestingly at NSA, when you're doing engineering and you're building complex systems and deploying them, you're also doing a whole bunch of security by default, right. uh, by nature of the agency. And so, sure. um, you know, kind of going after NIST best practices and software standards, really my entire career just sort of naturally translates into a security role uh, if you combine in some of that enterprise IT experience as well. Yeah, no, I agree. And it's funny, I, as you explain it, I realized that it the path isn't quite as linear as it looked to me on first blush. It just seemed like uh, just scaling more, you know, network <laughs> creation or system creation or what have you. But yeah, there really is a, a lot in there from, like you say, from people management to the sort of compliance and risk management uh, elements and so forth. Now, you said that the NSA sort of offered you or allowed you kind of a wide latitude in terms of like creating your own systems. Is uh, can you talk about that? Is that still the case with, uh, you know, things like uh, CMMC and, and you know, all these different regulatory frameworks going into mind? You, do, do you still think that there is that kind of flexibility uh, at work in terms of like taking the initiative and creating things to your 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 own style? Yeah, I mean, I think ultimately it's driven by what uh, the mission needs and what 
the outcomes you're trying to achieve really mm-hmm. like any company. I don't think the right. agency is different in that, that sense. I think, you know, it is clear to meet some of the security standards that are required and they are very rigorous inside a place like NSA. Um, and the ability to do that in a way that leverages modern technology, I think, has actually improved over the years as well. Um, and so I think there's just a ton of opportunity to develop in those spaces, very similar to how you would on the outside. I mean, there, there can sometimes be uh, additional security controls that maybe the average developer out in the industry doesn't have to deal with. Um, yeah. But I think there's still a fair bit of autonomy in how you solve for the mission needs. Got it. Um, can you talk about your average workday or work week as VP Deputy Chief Security Officer at, at GitHub? Because, you know, I think people want to know, you know, if I get to this position or work towards this position, what would what would be my primary responsibilities or tasks that I can count on to take over my day? And so can you tell me a little bit about that? What what point of the day does your to-do to list set itself on fire, you know? And, <laughs> Yeah, that's a fair question. Uh, So my day to day responsibilities are uh, essentially running the day to day for the security org inside GitHub. And so that includes our product security teams, which includes bug bounty and uh, product security incident response and Mm -hmm. kind of our architecture security review process Uh, includes security operations like threat hunting and uh, incident response and uh, platform abuse, things like that, anti abuse. Uh, GRC uh, and also Security Lab, which is kind of our outreach arm for education training and all those things. Mm-hmm. So I think what's interesting in terms of like how the the weeks unfold, um, GitHub has a very strong culture of focus on people and, and connection. Um, mm-hmm. We're all pretty much 100% remote and async at this point. Um, so there, there are a few offices around the world, but for the most part, we all work uh, remotely. And so um, I think I spend a lot of my time in one-on-ones with my leaders, with peers, with other leaders, yep. kind of building those relationships and being intentional about that. I think it's really important, particularly in a remote environment. Um, so I'd say like 40% of my time is people oriented um, right. okay. around people, you know, whether that's coaching, being coached, having, you know, peer conversations, things like that. I try to spend about 30% of my time on organizational work and kind of mission focused work. Like what do we, what do we have on the plate this week? What do we need to do? Mm -hmm. What are the kind of organizational uh, priorities that need to happen? And I'd say, you know, ideally 20% of the time on strategy and company level leadership. So as a, as a, an executive at a company like GitHub, um, I think it's really important to also look at how to level up the entire company. So my primary responsibility is the security department, but I think it's also important for leaders to be part of other leadership conversations around the company, whether that might be, you know, a mentoring program, you know, peer coaching, whatever it is, being present, engaged in leveling up the entire company and learning as well, I think is really important. And then the last bit, I try to spend um, uh, some amount of time with customers Mm -hmm. and doing external engagement as well, particularly in security. I think it's really important to be in front of customers and hear what their struggles are here where how, what their perceptions are. Um, and I think, you know, it's interesting security shifting to be a market differentiator, I think, for a lot of companies where it's not just like, oh, yeah, the security team keeps folks safe and keeps the product safe. And we don't really ever talk to them. They just kind of are off over there. But really, like consumers and and other customers really want to be discerning buyers and want to know how we do our work and how we keep them safe and how we keep their data safe. And so I try to spend uh, a little bit more time on that than I probably otherwise would. Okay. That, yeah, that's that's good to know, um, especially the the sort of people element. And it sounds like uh, you're still sort of have your hand in terms of evaluating what people are doing. And I, I also, I know that as, you know, a C-suite member that you have a sort of communication element to your job in terms of, I'm assuming, making the board understand why you're making certain decisions and why you're asking for more money for, you know, this or that or or what have you. Because, you know, that's something that our guests are always talking about is, you know, cybersecurity, like you can learn the tech, but you really need to know the the how to communicate it and how to yeah. communicate it to the non-tech sector. Is that, is that part of your job as well is, is sort of like that that sort of, you know, not evangelist, but someone who can can make hard concepts easy? Yeah, I th- I think that's definitely true of, of really any senior leadership role of mm-hmm. being able to communicate like incredibly complex issues in a way that that resonates, ties to business outcomes, ties to impact, 
Uh, thankfully, um, my boss, who's the CISO and engineering SVP, has a good grasp on all this as well. So it's okay. uh, quite easy to to chat with him and, and communicate yep. that as well. But teeing that up for not just uh, the board, but also um, you know customers and and other stakeholders, I think, is important as well. And so definitely, there's a lot of time there. And then you know, obviously. If there are security incidents, uh, we all pitch in and roll up our sleeves and, and go dig into that. So uh, right. that's, you know, obviously, obviously just part of the job being in security as well. Thankfully, uh, I have an amazing team that I trust and uh, they're empowered to go solve these problems. So I think uh, I think that makes my job quite a bit easier. Well, yeah, let's we'll, we'll be getting to that team real soon here, and I'm excited to, to learn more. But um, so, you know, we've given plenty of warning at the top of the show with this episode about is about and we've said it so far. But, uh, you know, just to reiterate, this is about GitHub. Um, so, you know, asking what is GitHub to a developer might feel like asking what is a library to an obsessive reader. But, you know, if you're a cybersecurity student or professional or want to be soon, you're probably going to be spending plenty of time on GitHub, whether searching for the exact tool you need or maybe just browsing it to see what's out there. So for listeners who are completely new to this space, can you explain briefly what GitHub is, who uses it, who contributes to it, and its current role in the software development field? Yeah, happy to. I mean, at a really high level, GitHub is a uh, cloud or SaaS provider. We also have on-prem solutions, but it's a way for developers to store and manage their code. And then a lot of the tools around that. So tracking those changes, building the outputs of the code. So um, continuous integration, continuous deployment, yep. um, the security tools around that. So it's it's really a, a platform for developers to, to build, manage, and the ecosystem that kind of goes around that. And so just to kind of give you a sense of scale, we have over 100 million developers on the platform uh, now, which is pretty incredible. And 90 of the Fortune 100 uh, are customers for the platform. Mm -hmm. And so we, um, we're we really embedded into the entire world's software development ecosystem in some way, shape, or form. And so even if you know a company is not using GitHub as their primary development tool, it's almost 100% certain that they're leveraging some sort of open source package that was developed yes. and built on GitHub. And I think that's another really important aspect of GitHub is it's not just for um, customers uh, who are, are paying customers. There's an open source component to it that's really core to what yeah. we do and have always done. And so uh, for those not familiar with that, open source is a way to collaborate and uh, contribute to software in a very open uh, way where the outputs of that and the collaboration is free and transparent to all. And it's a, a really incredible thing. And so I think I can't remember the latest stat, but it's something like 95 to 99 percent of all software has some component of it that's based on yeah. open source. And so really, that means that almost whole software has got some component that was built or developed around or through GitHub. Yeah. And I think that's something for uh, for us sort of noobs to have a hard time getting our heads around is that any sort of software development that you're going to do is going to be made up of lots of other people's code at different points. And, and it's almost like like making a cake or something. You're going to have to buy, get all these supplies. You're going to put your own spin on it, but you're still, you still need to get the eggs from the store. You're not going to raise your own chickens and so forth. So, I mean, can you talk about that? Like in an average, uh, you know, say like app development or something like that, like how many sort of uh, pieces of software, you know, tools, software, code, whatever, uh, you know, need to be pulled from kind of outside sources versus what's created, you know, by the team? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I mean, I think it really depends on uh, what the outcome is that the development team is trying to achieve. But I think in a lot of cases, you know, companies and even hobbyist developers have realized, like, what are, what's the value they want to add? Like, what's the mm -hmm. hard problem they want to go solve? And usually that's not re-implementing a thing that's been implemented before. So it's, sure. you know, whether that's text parsing or a graphics framework in JavaScript or a core security tool for, you know, scanning and looking for vulnerabilities. Like most of the time, it's the additional um, secret sauce that somebody wants to develop on top of those things. And so, yes. you know, often people will start with an open source foundation, pulling these tools together and then saying, okay, how, do I, how can I combine this in an innovative way or add to it or build a new either open source or, or uh, you know, commercial tool on top of it that goes with it. And so I think, you know, it's not true in every case, but I think many, many developers start with that open source foundation for whatever it is they're building. We certainly do, which is mm -hmm. no surprise in our yeah. tooling in GitHub. 
So since you joined GitHub in, in 2021, uh, the company has invested heavily in the security team and, and has doubled down on the company's commitment to fostering uh, better security team experiences across the software ecosystem. So uh, can you tell our listeners why and how this came about? I mean, I know that in my minimal poking around in GitHub, there was maybe a perception of the feeling of a Wild West feeling with everything kind of on display and available for use. So can you you talk about uh, what what brought up the the decision to to really lock in the the security team here? Yeah, I, I mean, ultimately, you know, GitHub's sort of been leading the way in helping developers create secure software for a long for a long time. Like we were very early adopters of bug bounties, um, you know, mm -hmm. acquisitions like Dependabot and Semmel, standing up the security lab. And so I think this is really just a continuation of those investments and the serious responsibility we take is kind of, as we talked about before, being really central to the software development ecosystem. And so, you know, with 100 million developers on the platform and then more upstream dependencies, right, there's a there's a huge opportunity for us mm -hmm. um, to really have that impact. And so I think each member of the security team takes that very seriously. We actually talk about it on a fairly regular basis, like in one-on-ones mm -hmm. and other discussions. But, you know, I think that it's a recognition the company also takes it seriously as well. And just for my own uh, understanding, when you say upstream dependencies, that means like, for instance, a, a bunch of different apps might use this one thing, you know, this one piece of, of tool. And if that has a vulnerability in it, then it becomes a problem for everything. Is that is that kind of what I'm yeah, I think that's part of it. I think mm -hmm. too, like, you know, the there's so many companies whose products depend on GitHub every day, mm -hmm. right? Their mm -hmm. developers may spend all day long in GitHub. And then the average consumer who downloads that app on their uh, mobile phone or uses it on their computer or interacts with a bank may not realize that like that work actually happened on GitHub. And so yep. we kind of recognize and see that that dependency stream and do our best to kind of continue that investment and continue to focus on what can we do to make that more secure, make it easier for developers to do their job uh, and, and go from there. All right, so what, what are some of the security risks that GitHub faces? Uh, do, what tasks do this enlarged security team have to perform to keep things safe and, and on even keel? Yeah, I, th I think, you know, we probably face a lot of the same tasks that a lot of others in the ecosystem do. Um, you know, there's threat actors out there looking for to make a, a quick payday. Right. Um, mm -hmm. In our case, you know, because we do have so many kind of key customers. Right. That's a thing that we think about a lot. How do we protect our customer data and intellectual property? That's really, really important to us. And we we spend a lot of time and energy and resources thinking about that. Um, you know, one of the other things that we spend a fair bit of time on because GitHub is so widely used and it's such a big platform is how to detect and combat abuse as well. And so right. we have a whole team, which is, I think, you know, somewhat unique in the security space in our security team that's focused on building machine learning models and creating tools and detections to detect abuse, but also combat it. And, you know, we have to do it effectively near real time to be able to right. handle the scale uh, of the threat actors out there. Yeah. Uh, so um, can you talk about GitHub's role in the area of software security uh, and some of your suggested best practices in in making a developer focused security team? What are some common, you know, issues or mistakes that you see in, in security teams in this regard? Yeah, I, I think about this probably in a couple different ways. You know, one from the developer's perspective, how do we help developers stay in the flow and have the, the security tools they need at their fingertips so that it's not mm -hmm. an interrupt driven process. It's it's sort of baked into how they do their work. And so yeah. if you look at some of our products like Dependabot and secret scanning and things like that, code scanning, it's, it's really baked into that GitHub experience. And we provide those also uh, for free for open source public projects as well. And so, you know, certainly our, our paying customers get those as, as part of their GitHub Advanced Security um, subscriptions. But, you know, we also, because of the importance of the ecosystem and open source, right, any open source developer with a public repo can turn these features on as well, which is really cool. Mm -hmm. um, from like a, a more kind of, if you take a step back from that developer flow, when I'm talking to customers, the three things I always talk about of like, what are the top three things folks can do? And this, it depends on the customer and depends on the, on the situation. So this is slightly abstracted, but turning on multi-factor authentication and SSO, if you have mm -hmm. SSO available, like those, that's just table stakes now, I think, because yeah. of so many threat actors going after account takeovers and all the yep. data, like 
like credentials being leaked all the all the places and and you can go purchase them on uh, in various darker places of the internet like it's just sure. important to start with that yeah the second one we talk about a lot of secret scanning um one of the biggest threats and most successful threats we see on a regular basis is a threat actor getting access to source code that had secrets stored in it Mm-hmm. And then they take those secrets and go do something much worse than just get access to the source code. They pivot into an infrastructure, they get access to yep. another uh, SaaS tool and, and just kind of keep going from there. And so we talk a lot about, you know, the importance of secret hygiene and storing secrets in the correct place, in the in the right place and, you know, keeping them out of code when possible. And that's where our secret scanning tools come in. And then the last one's really kind of basic, but it's what do you have hooked up to your systems, both GitHub and other places? Yeah. Like, what are your third-party integrations? Because all those integrations end up having their own security risks as well. And so yeah. understanding that kind of total landscape, I think, is really important. And so those are kind of the three big ones that I tend to also draw from a lot, maybe not exclusively, but a lot. Well, good, because my next question was was about uh, a point number two there. So uh, especially, you know, about, uh, um, you know, understanding uh, code vulnerabilities and so forth. So uh, one of my past guests on our podcast and and one of my re- returning guests, Susan Morrow, was talking about digital identity. But along the way, she noted, based on something that we were talking about, that um, uh, having a background in secure coding isn't just good for analyzing code that your own developers create, but can help you become sort of a quality assurance member of the team. You're evaluating tools and apps found on GitHub to make sure, you know, that you aren't introducing issues or vulnerabilities. And like you said, the, you know, the, the, the example of having secrets inside of a a piece of code. And so speaking to that role and to that task, do you have advice for anyone using GitHub or not just secure code experts for navigating the available tools with an eye for determining their strength of security and usability? Sure. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, to kind of go back to like, um, not everybody's got that security background. I think I think that's okay. And I think, mm-hmm. you know, understanding sort of the basics and the fundamentals about threats and risks and vulnerabilities is really important. And then leveraging other tools to help with the details of that, I think is, is where the sweet yep. spot can be for a lot of people. And so like not all developers are security experts who use GitHub and that's totally fine. Mm-hmm. So that's where I think a combination of things like, turning on some of the security tools by default, just so that, you know, we're all, we're just constantly scanning repos for secrets, which we do for public repos already as a company, but like, you know, even private repos, I think it's important for, for teams to think about that. Mm -hmm. And then things like our bug bounty program. So being able to like have that open to where folks can kind of provide that feedback as well. I do think there's also um, for folks kind of getting started, how, how to think about this space. There's some really good guides that we produce and that other partners produce as well on like, when you're thinking about GitHub Actions, which is the kind of our core CI CD platform, mm-hmm. how do you secure that? How do you harden it? How do you make sure that the things yeah. that it's building are secure? And so there's really great guides out there for things like that. Um, and I think for folks kind of looking for that way to step into it, there's another interesting opportunity with Code Spaces, which is our kind of ability to kind of get a almost like a clean room that we host hmm. where you can do compute. Uh, you don't have to worry about like trying to build an environment on your laptop or your computer and somewhat somebody else's kind of cloud environment. You can just kind of get it up and running quickly okay. on GitHub and do the builds and the development there. And so there's like this ability to kind of have a clean room set up uh, in some ways, which is nice. Yeah, I was gonna say it's like like you get you've given them virtual study halls or something like. That. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm I'm personally really excited about this. Is um, I was talking to a university professor uh, not too long ago and. They had not heard yet that we were releasing um, free a free tier for Code Spaces. I think it's sixty right. hours a month, and so they were really excited because this is an opportunity to say like you can get even like a classroom environment up. Say like, hey, we want you to do this project. Here's the config file. You run it on Code Spaces. You know every single student has the exact same environment. There's no changes, and when it's done, you can you know close it down, shut it off, and it's not a thing a university has to worry about securing over yeah. time and keeping up with. Yeah, that's a that's a great tool, and a, and and I hope listeners are, are are looking into that. Is that is it, you said you're excited about? It. Is that is that sort of a new development? That's something uh, that's just been added. It, the, it's over the code space was released, I think, a little bit uh, about a year ago. Okay, um, but the the kind of free tier of uh, the sixty hours, I think, came along with our GA not too long ago. Gotcha. 
Okay. Um, so yeah, I have a, just a couple more questions for you here. And, and right now we're going to kind of move into the, uh, the sort of work por portion of cyber work. So for, for young people or, or older people transitioning into cybersecurity, software security, or software development, uh, do you have any advice for areas of study or skills or experiences that you should be pursuing that will help you rise to the top of the resume pile in this area? In other words, like what does a company looking to hire new talent want to see that you've done, learned, or, or documented? Yeah. Um, you know, first of all, I would say I'm a really firm believer that diversity is key to building a world-class security program. I mean, I think that's true really of any team, but, you know, we're talking about security today. And so that's all types of diversity, right? It's cultural, it's race, it's gender, but it's also mm -hmm. professional background. And so, yep. you know, to, to folks who are hiring and listening to this out there in security, um, I would encourage people to take a broader view of folks that are looking to get in or maybe have a non-traditional professional background, because I think um, having people on the team who think differently, who've experienced different things in different professions is really, really important. I mean, there are cases where we need very specific set of background and experiences. Like if we're hiring a specific engineering right. manager or a very technical team, right? Like it's, it, we're going to need somebody who's got experience in that space. But I think there's a lot of other roles in security that um, aren't don't require that like very tailored specific technical experience, but could benefit from a broader view. And so, you know, in terms of like how to get started and what to focus on, I think I usually tell folks technical experience translates everywhere. So hmm. taking Azure classes that are free or, you know, GitHub does a bunch of free training as well. Um, Linux programming, networking, like whatever is exciting to that person, taking some of the free classes, learning in that space, that technical foundation is going to translate really into any any discipline in security and be helpful. Nice. That's uh, that's great advice. So um, as, as the task of juggling an almost infinite number of moving parts, uh, many of which originate on GitHub, it feels like at least, again, to my my sort of way of seeing things, it, it, it feels like that, uh, you know, development becomes an increasingly complex proposition. Uh, in cybersecurity, a lot of my guests have said that half of anything you learn today will be out of date in six months. So with so secure software development, you know, it feels like that window might even be a little shorter and, and worryingly, it could feel a little overwhelming to jump into this line of work when it seems like there's so much existing knowledge and new knowledge to absorb quickly. It's like, like, you know, trying to merge onto a 70 mile per hour highway for from a stop position. So do you have any thoughts on breaking down the massive task of entering the software security space and getting up to the same high speed that other developers seem to live and swim in? Yeah, it's a really good question. And it can certainly on a daily basis feel that way. Um, I think if I take a step back, you know, certainly the specific tech changes at just an incredibly rapid pace. I mean, if anyone subscribes to like, you know, new cloud services coming from one of the big cloud providers, it's it's almost impossible to keep up with all the changes that are happening there. Mm -hmm. But, you know, at a fundamental level, though, I don't think the fundamental tech approaches change all that regularly, right? There are some key shifts, right? The, the cloud adoption and the cloud services and SaaS and PaaS and all IaaS and all those things over the last okay. 15 years, I think is a fairly fundamental shift that we've seen. But those core principles, I think, once they're integrated into somebody's thinking and technical approach, really translate into any field. And so, you know, chasing the latest um, JavaScript framework or new cool tool can be fun, but I think the the core principles of both software development and security really um, stay the same. And so I think, you know, the second thing I'll say in that space too, is I think open source is a bit of a normalizing opportunity here. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. Right. Like being able to participate in open source, see the code other people are writing, contribute, right? Like it's fairly straightforward as a new developer to go open a pull request on an open source repository and just start to be part of that ecosystem and community. And that may lead to helping fix some bugs. And that may be yeah. that may lead to becoming a maintainer and mm -hmm. answering questions for other people. And then all of a sudden that person's part of this broader technical ecosystem. And so wow. um, I, it's also probably the new form of a resume as well of, you know, yeah. send me your GitHub profile. Yeah, and yeah, we'll go yeah. Browse through and see what open source you've been, you know, contributing to. It's it's definitely something I look at when I'm looking at resumes as well. If somebody has that listed, I'll go take a browse and see oh, that's what great. That's a great see tip. what their chart looks like and see what. Yeah, been that's up to. A, that you know because I think uh, people have said that for years about LinkedIn that you know people can you know in, quote unquote endorse you for different things, but that doesn't really mean anything because you can't really look into it. But yeah, something like this where you can actually 
uh, that's a really good way to sort of expand the experience section of your resume. So I hope you all yeah. are taking notes. That's a great idea. Uh, so I'm about to wrap up here, but uh, one thing I, I learned from a previous guest about developers is, uh, and I'm paraphrasing him, and you, you talked about this a little bit, but they're, they're convenience focused to a fault because everything has to be done at high speeds all the time and expediency is required, you know, not just to meet deadlines, but to stay in the flow without being interrupted. You know, some developers will have access codes and passwords all over their computer desktop or in easy to find places you know, which is easy for them, but it makes them kind of a veritable pirate's treasure if someone should breach the company and navigate to their workstation. So you talked about this a little bit before, was we talk about software security and, and DevSecOps and so forth. Can you speak about security tips for developers? Are there ways to speed up the authorization process? Sounds like some that maybe even GitHub has developed, but uh, without leaving all of your cred credentials basically sticky noted to your forehead every time you're working. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, I think a couple parts to that. One is, um, you know, we are focused on making security easy and automated within the flow, right? Like, sure, developers want a convenience focused flow and don't want to get out of the flow. And when I used to write code all day long, every day, right, you're in the flow and you get pulled out of it, it can take, I think it's 15 to 20 minutes to get back into it as a At developer. Least, yeah. <laughs> we don't want our developers to break out of that flow. And we certainly yeah. don't want our customers uh, and, you know, the 100 million developers that use our platform to be there as well. If you start to think about the minutes wasted of breaking that flow, it, it gets a little overwhelming. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I think the key is, you know, put, from the beginning, trying to think about some of these security principles as a developer. And I think, you know, that's probably one of the shift that shifts that I think we're seeing over the last few years is software development and security are, are almost the same thing now. Like it's doing software development in a vacuum and not thinking about security is becoming less and less of, uh, I think, an expectation um, for companies. And I think, you know, for developers as well. And so kind of approaching uh, technical challenges with that in mind, like, okay, cool. I'm going to go build this software platform. Where do I put my secrets? Like, how do I think about IM and, and building those mm -hmm. in as part of that core design? I think we're just going to see more and more of that. Um, yeah. I also think, you know, it depends on, are we talking about developers who are building kind of core infrastructure or more like app face, like user facing apps. And there's kind of different models um, to think about it. You know, we were kind of talking about earlier things. So complex, you yeah. know, some of these infrastructure apps are really, really complex and you can't just go sit down and build because it may use like 10 core cloud services and IAM provider, right. um, you know, network connections, storage, all these things. And so um, I think that's where having a, a core team with these experiences and being able to think about what is security from the outset is so important uh, and, and kind of bake it in from the beginning. That's that's yeah that that's great to hear yeah I think that's a I think that's some some excellent advice there so uh, yeah we're just about to finish here but as we wrap up today uh, we've already talked quite a bit about GitHub but if there's anything you want to discuss uh, further regarding upcoming changes or innovations or rollouts that uh, that you're excited about uh, you feel free to do so here oh yeah um, you know one thing I'll mention that we're starting to see some really interesting and fun traction on is we just released something called private vulnerability reporting. Okay. And so um, this allows open source maintainers, of which there are many, many on GitHub, to be able to accept uh, private uh, vulnerability reports from researchers or developers or whoever. So they're using the open source tool, they find something they think might be a security issue. And instead of trying to go figure out a way to contact the, the maintainer or you know, sometimes post it publicly, which is not always the best responsible yeah. disclosure method. Um, you know, we now have a way for them to report that privately and it can be triaged by the maintainer. And then it's okay. kind of built into our whole depend dependency security tools as well, if it's if it kind of moves forward from there. And so I think, you know, I'm excited to continue to watch that space. I think it's yeah. we're just at the beginning of seeing the benefits of that for the security community. Very cool. Uh, all right. One last question for all the marbles. If our listeners want to learn more about Jacob DePriest or GitHub, uh, where should they go online? Uh, I'm at Jacob DePriest on LinkedIn and, and GitHub and most of the social media. So feel free to find me on any of those. Okay. And do you mind if our uh, listeners drop you a line? Not at all. Great. Would love to hear from them. All right. Well, Jacob, thank you for joining me today and, and for helping our listeners navigate the ocean of info over at GitHub. This definitely helped me and I'm sure it helped them as well. Thanks, Chris. It was a pleasure. Uh, and as always, I'd like to thank you all for listening to and watching the Cyberwork podcast uh, on an unprecedented scale. The uh, the needle just keeps going up, and we're really delighted to have you all along for the ride. So keep keep subscribing, keep hitting the notification buttons, tell your friends. 
uh, tell your teachers, whatever you want to do. But um, but thank you for what you're doing right now. Uh, so I'm going to remind you to go to infosecinstitute.com slash free to get your free cybersecurity talent development ebook. It's got in-depth training plans for the 12 most common roles, including SOC analyst, penetration tester, cloud security engineer, information risk analyst, privacy manager, secure coder, and more. Uh, we took notes from employers and a team of subject matter experts to build training plans that align with the most in-demand skills. You can use plans as is or customize them to create a unique training plan that aligns with your own unique career goals. So one more time, that's infosecinstitute.com slash free, or click the link in the description below to get your free tra training plans, plus many more free resources. It's being updated all the time. Uh, thank you once again to Jacob DePriest, and thank you so much uh, to all of you for watching and listening. And as always, we'll speak to you next week. Take care now.